Oh, wow. What a, what a wonderful audience. I haven't had this much fun since I was at Southwest Airlines. I was uh, there about 10 years. I was manager of customer service training. So it's near and dear to my heart. What you do is near and dear to my heart. You uh, are also valuable. This place doesn't work without you. And so turn to somebody and say, you're valuable. I feel better already. Now I find that at this point in the program, it's very important for a speaker to get into rhythm with their audience. So before I get going, I'm gonna do a quick audience interaction technique. This is really simple. It's called a power clap. So give yourself a little room. I'm gonna say one, two, three, power clap. I'm gonna bring my hands together just like that. Your job is to see if you can bring your hands together at exactly the same time. Now this is a large group, so I've never done it with this big of a group before. So let's see how we do. Are you ready? One, two, three, power clap. That was okay. It was a little loose over here somewhere. <laughs> Food service, I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. Let's try it again, ready? One, two, three, power clap. That was much better. Last time, one, two, three, power clap. Two power claps. Three power claps. Thank you, thank you very much. Might be the only applause I get, I don't know. I'm gonna come at you today with this concept of culture, specifically creating a culture of customer service. Everybody in here serves somebody. You either serving the internal customer, you're serving the student, you're serving the family. Most of you probably are serving all of those people. You're serving the faculty, you're serving everybody. So this idea of customer service is critical, but framing it up in the concept of creating a culture of service is critical. Southwest is successful, and they have the exact same positions that I see in the room here. Maintenance and flight ops and flight, uh, in flight and customer service positions and uh, uh, all types of positions, just like in this room. And for them to be successful, they have created a culture of internal and external customer service. So let me get into this concept of culture topia. Culture topia is the title of a book I wrote. It's simply a word that I made up. I was looking for a word that when you did a search for it, you got no hits. So there's an original internet word for you right there. If I were to break the word down for you, here's the cover of the book, but if I were to break the word culturetopia down for you, it is a place where there's high performance and high fulfillment all in the same place. Who in the room would like to leave a legacy of a performing at a very high level and you were very satisfied and fulfilled in your work. Who would like to do that? Most of us want to have that legacy. I mean, most of, we don't want to be remembered as the angriest person. I slept the most. No one wants that legacy, right? But you do want a legacy of high performance, high fulfillment, right? Your students want to be there. Parents want their students to be there, for the most part, in most cases. This idea of high performance, high fulfillment. Unfortunately, that's not how life works. We can't stay there all the time. So there's these three other spaces that we find ourselves. I've been in all four at any time, any given place, depending on the circumstances. Sometimes I'm in high performance, high fulfillment, things are going along fine, something changes, someone pushes my fairness button, and all of a sudden I slide over to high performance, low fulfillment. Now I'm still showing up, I'm still doing the job, I'm just not as happy as I once was. What are the attitudes and behaviors of people who find themselves in high performance, low fulfillment? They can get frustrated, they can get bitter, right? They can light up the break room, can't they? Look what they did to us this week. I can't believe this new policy. Don't nudge anybody, I saw someone, that's you, right? This idea of high performance, low fulfillment, it's a dangerous place to get. If we allow a student to stay there, or a coworker to stay there, they will slide down. Eventually, they will slide down to low performance, low fulfillment. I see lots of heads nodding. And I see it happen all the time. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching and that's where I find people. They've, they've, they, they've slid down to this space of low performance, low fulfillment. 
What are the attitudes and behaviors of those folks? Late wine complain, sabotage steal. That's all before noon. All right? This is a beautiful picture of what inspiration could look like. Who in the room would like to be remembered as an inspirational person? Most of you wanna, are going to raise your hand on that. If you can stay in high performance, high fulfillment, it gives you the ability, when you see people slide over, it gives you the ability to reach out and help them back. This is where culture begins to impact the service package. Because people who stay available are willing to reach out and inspire the people around them. That's what you do. On your campuses, you inspire students. On the bus, you inspire students. In the cafeteria, you inspire students. You know what the word inspire means? It's a Latin word. It simply means to breathe. When you breathe, you inspire. When you do not breathe, you expire. Very good. I'm glad you're on the front row. It literally means to come alongside a student, come alongside a coworker, and they're down and out, and you just give them a breath. You breathe life right into them. It's a beautiful picture of inspiration, what you do every day. But don't devalue it. You have the opportunity. They're all around us. People are starving for a breath. And sometimes you need the breath. I know sometimes I do. And so I find people around me that can breathe life into me. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was manager of customer service training for, uh, at Southwest. Then I got the idea that I could do what y'all do. I thought I could manage people, facilities, and resources. So I became manager of customer service for Los Angeles International Airport. Uh, that is a terrible job. Do not take that job. And I went there in 92, 93, and we had all the stuff happen, the OJ stuff happen, and all the Northridge earthquake and all that stuff. And I was born and raised in Dallas, Texas, so concrete doesn't do this here. And, uh, but when I got there, there was a person who was about to lose her job because of her attendance. And one more occurrence, and she was going to lose her job. And I asked the other uh, employees, I said, why can't she get to work on time? They go, we don't know. I had a conversation with this lady. You know what the problem was? Her car battery was unreliable, and she couldn't get to work on time. Now, if you want to breathe life into that situation, what do you do? You buy a battery. But I didn't buy it. You know what? One of our employees said, let's take a collection of all the other employees. Everybody pitched in a dollar. We had 90 ticket agents, 12 skycaps, 10 supervisors, three station accountants. Everybody pitched in a dollar. Our maintenance guy installed it. This lady was so grateful. She got back into good standing. She was so grateful. All she needed was a breath. They're all around us. And collectively, we can help each other. Collectively, we can endure together. Collectively, we can thrive. And collectively, we can inspire. But we've got to be willing to do it with each other every day. Got to be willing to come in and, and look for those opportunities. Because if I'm so self-focused, I'm going to miss it. Because they're all around us. And if I can get out of self and start looking into other, man, there's opportunities every day to inspire. Now, be careful because there is this other space. There we go. Low performance, high fulfillment. They're happy as pie to be here. They just don't know what they're doing yet. <laughs> now, be careful. That might be your new hire. So give them a break. In Southwest, we call them ignorance on fire. Hey, I got the job. Now, if you've been here for 10 years or you have somebody the, around you that's been here for 10 years that are in that space, that person has quit and stayed. So you either have to get them re-engaged or help them finish the quitting process. Believe me, you'll thank yourself, you'll thank the other person if we do it. Stay fully present, stay fully engaged. You spend half your awake life at work. It ought to be a place you enjoy going. It ought to be a place where there's high performance and high fulfillment. And I can see some of you still looking at me like, yeah, you don't seem to understand who we work for. I know. But we want to be able to do that in spite of circumstance because you can only control you, right? And all the other changes that happen, collectively we come together and we can create this culture of customer service. All right, so what really drives performance is how well we work together. How well are we functioning all the different departments together, functioning as one unit in this idea of delivering great service. There's a word I like for this. It goes a little bit deeper than teamwork. It's a term that is relational coordination. 
that you're being deliberate every day about how you relate to the people around you. Vendor, suppliers, students, teachers, parents, uh, coworkers, uh, everybody in the room in, in this, this participating in this relational coordination. Now, I didn't think of this term. A lady named uh, Dr. Jody hoffer Gattel thought of this. She teaches at Brandeis University, and uh, she began to study this idea of relational coordination and the impact of relational coordination on performance. And she got the idea when she was delivering her first child. She noticed this amazing relational coordination between doctors, nursing, administration labs, transport, pharmacy. If you think of all the different departments that have to work together for there to be a healthy delivery and get the child back to the right person, amazing. And then she said, I wonder if I could prove it in the legal environment. She began to study attorneys, paralegal, secretaries, administration, client satisfaction went up, billing errors went down. The higher the relational coordination, the better the performance. And then she said, I wonder if I can prove it in aviation. And she began to study American Airlines at Boston's Logan Airport. That's long before Southwest flew to the Northeast. And the manager at American said, if you want to study an airline that has great relational coordination, you should go to Texas and study Southwest. And that's where I met Jody. I was assigned to her research team. And she ended up naming her research the Southwest Airlines way. How to use the power of relationships to achieve high performance. I know that some of you, every day, you get into transaction mode, and we forget that we're in a relationship business. Customer service is all about the relationship. And it's so easy to get transaction focused, and we're on to the next thing that we forget that we're having to coordinate with people around us to make it work. Here's what Jody found. Let's see if you can relate to this. Two types of tension that you guys deal with every day. This is just in a, a broad general sense. There's performance tension. That's everything that you have to do to execute the function of your job. So every day you have to show up and perform. There are certain requirements that you have to do every day. That's your performance tension. And then there's people tension. People tension, according to Jody's research, is anything that can get in the way of me executing the function of my job. So over here, coming over here today, had there been a wreck out on 35 and I couldn't get here, my people tension would have went way up because now I can no longer perform, right? So we, we wanna to try to minimize the people tension. Here's what Jody found. If you have high people tension, performance drops. And she estimates as much as half speed. You ever seen somebody going half speed? Don't nudge anybody. <laughs> That's you. I was working with a lady in Austin, Texas. Uh, she's the VP of HR for a company there. And I asked her, I said, how many people work here? She said, about half. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good answer. You know, depending on what, how much gossip's going on, depending on what policy doesn't make sense, depending on what change happened, we gotta have about half of them going. We wanna get everybody going. And to do that, we're gonna have to lower the tension. Here's the problem though, we're all so different. Have you noticed this? And for us to really appreciate each other, I've gotta give up my point of view and I've gotta understand your viewing point. I gotta know where you're coming from. Whether you be my boss, my coworker, a parent, a student, I've gotta give up my point of view and try to understand your viewing point. I'm gonna give you four scales of behavior because we're all like icebergs floating around. There we go. We're like icebergs floating around. And what I'm showing you today is the tip of my iceberg, right? I'm not gonna show you what's in the middle. I got some things that I've, I've done I don't wanna tell anybody. The problem is we all have different stuff sticking out of the water. And if I had to work with you or you had to work with me, I'd have to understand where you're coming from if I'm really gonna be effective. If we're gonna create a, a culture of service, it starts with us, department to department. Uh, within each department, we've gotta understand each other. And then we've gotta be willing to be curious about that other person who may be frustrating. Have you ever worked with somebody that feels like they take you there? It takes concentration and energy to work with them. You don't know why, maybe it's a student, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's another department, or maybe they take you to the other side. It's kind of like being right and left-handed. I have both, I prefer my right. I don't want to get rid of my left, I just prefer my right. When I go to my right hand, it's like going to the tip of my iceberg. It's functional, it's easy, I don't have to think about it. But if I switch to my left, I have to concentrate. 
It's not near as functional. It's not near as productive. It's like going to the bottom. There we go, of my iceberg. Have you ever worked with somebody that takes you to the bottom of your iceberg? Let me say it differently. Have you ever had an uncontrollable urge just to slap somebody? Just one time, I'll knock you off that ladder. Yeah, everybody's got a name in their head right now. Yeah, it's hard, because we have to work with people that are so different. Let me give you four scales of behavior. I want you to see if you can recognize yourself, and then I want you to think of that person that you had that name in your head, and I want you to ask yourself, are they really trying to be difficult? Or maybe just over the years, we've let it separate us. Maybe they're just different. Maybe they're not trying to be difficult. Maybe we've just let the gap grow. Because when we let the gaps grow, we begin to blame it on everything that it's not. And it's really just that we're different. First scale of behavior, here we go. Right now, everybody in the room is gathering information and making decisions. It's a mental processing function. It's happening dynamically right now. You can't help it, you're gathering and you're deciding is this useful or not. There's two distinct ways that people do this. Some of you in the room are very gut reaction. You can recognize gut reaction people because they walk fast, they talk fast. When they want stuff, they want it right now. They like to snap for some reason when they want stuff. They are very gut reaction. They don't have to think long about uh, decisions. Want to get married, you'll do. They're fast, gut-level decision makers. They don't have to take a long time with that. But they're working with people who have a strong need to analyze. Now, I can recognize some of the analyzers in the room because analyzers, when they're gathering information, they like to touch their face. And they make noises like this. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Did you check with Jessica? All right. And then they say what? Let me, let me think about it. Let me get back to you. If you're a gut reaction person, that makes you crazy. What's there to get back to? You got analysis paralysis. Just make a decision. Analyzers are looking back going, why are you in such a hurry to be wrong again? And it is a flyby and we miss each other. No wonder there's challenges in the workplace. No wonder the customer service culture doesn't grow because we, we are dismissing each other just because we're different. Next scale, some of you love your routine. In your work style, you wake up at the same time, you go to work the same way, and you park in the same spot. Uh, These people are very structured. They have controlled productivity throughout their day. They get great satisfaction checking off their list. They go on vacation, they have all the confirmation numbers typed out. Very structured, very organized. But they're working with people. They're like, whatever, man, whatever. Whatever. Two ways to go someplace, they'll go either way, depending on how they feel. They love to wake up early and go park in their spot just to mess with them, just to watch them short circuit just a little bit. They can go on vacation and not even know where they're staying. It gives them no heartburn at all. They have random bursts of productivity. They go in to get a drink of water, end up cleaning out the refrigerator. They don't know why. It just seems like the thing to do then. Very different. No wonder we frustrate each other. No wonder we don't get along. Next scale, some of you have a high attention to detail. You can proofread the newspaper and find mistakes. You can balance your checkbook to the penny, right? (laughs) But they're working with people who, let's just do this thing, man. A good plan today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow. They don't even keep a checkbook registry. They call the credit union. Can I write one for 50? (laughs) All right, thanks. It's worth it not to have to keep up with the details. No wonder we frustrate each other. And then last scale is energy. Some of you in the room get energy from other people. When the dance-off was going on, man, some of you just came alive, that energy, because you're drawn to the external. You love to be the life of the party. You, you couldn't wait to get on stage because it gives you energy, right? These people are the people you date that say this. Hi, I'm going to tell you about me, then... You can tell me about me. (laughs) They like that focus on them. Gives them energy. But they're working with people who are internally recharged. After this meeting, some of you cannot wait to have 30 minutes of solitude, internal reflection by yourself. You cannot wait to get away from this crowd because the crowds drain you of energy. You can be wild and crazy, but afterwards, you need that solitude to recharge your batteries. Now, I've been with you a few minutes now. Based on how I facilitate, Just based on what you see me do up here, if you really wanted to be curious and interested in other people, it's very easy to pick out. 
if we'll take a step back and realize, wow, I have a responsibility to my coworkers, to my customers, to give up my point of view and really try to understand where they're coming from. Let me promise you one thing. You get good at this, it will serve you your whole career. It doesn't matter what you do. It will serve you well. Southwest Airlines spends a ton of time helping employees understand this about their customers because every customer has different needs and different wants and different, and so we try to meet the customer where the customer is. We don't try to change them into copies of us, all right? So based on how I facilitate, do you think I'm more gut reaction or analyzed? Anybody, what do you think? Total gut reaction, you can see it. Ask me the time, I'll build you a watch. Am I routine or whatever? I am a whatever, thank you. Now I can do routine pretty good because my job requires that. So this is not an excuse to say, well that's just how I am, take it or leave it. No, that's not the point. The point is, is I'm gonna try to move closer to your viewpoint so that I can relate well to you. So I am whatever. Just do it, and obviously I'm external. If I were to join your department tomorrow, what adjustments would you make to bring out the best in me? Some of you are like, we would not hire you to work in our department. <laughs> You're a little hyper for us. But that's the spirit behind this, right? The spirit behind it is I'm gonna give up my point of view and really try to relate well to you. I'm telling you, if you spend time working on it, it will serve you well. This PowerPoint will be available. I don't know how we'll distribute it, but if you want it, you can get a copy of it. Run back through it. Begin to think through your approach with people, and it will serve you well. Hey, the same is true at home. Uh, I'm about to hit 23 years with my wife. Um, she's exactly opposite of me, and man, it's hard. And if you know who've uh, been through that, you know what I'm talking about. She is uh, off the chart analyzer. And uh, she, she does medical sales, and she has Longview and Tyler, some of those outlying uh, cities from Dallas. And uh, it's about a two-hour drive back in. And every now and then, we hit the house at the same time. Every now and then. And I ask the obvious question, how was your day? Well, she's been thinking about that for two hours. And she starts to download levels of information that I'm not really prepared for and, frankly, don't really want to hear. Right? And it's frustrating and she'll go on about doctors and nurse practitioners and all this stuff. And, uh, and, I can, and I know you're supposed to non-verbally attend, maintain eye contact, act interested, and reflect feelings. I know that. But it's hard. It is. I feel frustration creeping up the back of my neck. And I'm finally like, did we win the Aspen trip or not? I don't care about it. I just want to know about the sales contest. It's hard at home, and I like her. No wonder we have frustration in the workplace. We don't have the affection built. We don't have the commitment built. She's a routine person. She'll say, will you pick up the dry cleaning? Here's what goes off in my head. I'm going by Home Depot tomorrow to pick up some stump killer. The cleaners is right there. So I say, sure, I'll pick it up. Here's what goes off in her head. This is a contract for today. We have had war over starch. I guess you don't think my career is as important as your career. Yes, I do. I'm on your benefit plan. <laughs> it's very, very important. Guys, this is hard at home. Spend time working on it. Because if you do, here's what Jody found. If you can, oh, I, I jumped ahead. Let me, let me go back to this in the context of team. So we begin to understand each other. We begin to value each other. I begin to appreciate your difference. Here's what we can then form. This idea of a team model. Trust begins to form. We begin to use each other's expertise. We begin to align ourselves to the, to the is it called the core four? Is that what we call it? right, those customer service principles, and then we measure it. Unfortunately, most organizations do it in reverse. They're so busy measuring, they're so busy trying to get people in alignment, right, they forget about getting the people in the right job and they forget about building trust. Most of the time we're going from the bottom up, we've gotta start with trust. We gotta get back to where we can believe in each other. And it doesn't matter um, how the, the door revolves. Because that's always going to happen. But you know what? There's a core group here that's always going to be here. And you're going to be welcoming in and ushering in a new people into a culture that's successful, a culture of service. And so we gotta, we got to unite in our core because we all come together. The people in this room are power. There's enough power in this room to do anything. You can totally shift the culture. There's enough weight in this room to shift the whole culture. But we've got to start paying attention to each other. 
and make sure that we're building this trust, expertise, alignment, measurement. If you want to look at it from a motivation standpoint, we're lowering people tension, we're raising performance. We start with the relationship first. That means that we have trust in the people side, that lowers tension. Expertise is going to raise performance. I guarantee it. We've got to start with the ground floor. And then people start to buy in, commitment's lowering the tension, and alignment is raising performance. And guess what breaks out? Motivation breaks out because inspiration is there. And accountability is driving the tension down, and measurement is pulling performance through the roof. Guys, it works. I know it's a simple model, but I watched it work at Southwest Airlines. They've been profitable since 1973 in an industry that loses billions. Southwest has been unbelievable in their success because they use simple things like this, relationship-based leadership practices. And when I say the word leadership, I'm not talking about hierarchy. I'm talking about everybody in this room has leadership influence. And every day you're making an impact. You're either making a positive inspirational impact or you're bringing people down every day. It's not one or the other. And we gotta decide, spend one minute in the car before you walk in and say, okay, I'm gonna be inspirational today. I'm not gonna be negative. Because it's a choice. It is, it's a choice. I don't know about you, but I wanna be on the team that's on the right. I don't care how talented you are, if you're not pulling together, it's not gonna be a fun experience. It just won't be. And here's what Jody found. We keep people tension low, performance shoots up, and she estimates as much as 95% of our energy can go into task completion, customer service, rela relational coordination, but we're gonna have to spend the energy to give up our point of view and try to understand the other person's viewing point. Are you still with me? Everybody okay? All right, good. I'm not trying to be too preachy, I just know it works and I want the best for this room. You deserve it, you spend half your wake life at work, you deserve to be able to come in and, and feel present and feel that service between each other. I mean, think about it, who do you like to work around? What kind of person? Happy, positive, fun, enthusiastic, energetic people, right? Yeah, most of us want to, we want to be remembered as that kind of person and we certainly want to work around those kind of people. Let me say it differently. Let me say it this way. Let's say we're all going to a party. Everybody's going to be at the party. Who do you want to be around at the party? <laughs> I was teaching this at Shepherd Air Force Base. One of the airmen said, the bartender. I said, that's not the answer. That's not the answer. If you go to a party, you want to be around positive, fun, energetic, enthusiastic people. I guarantee you no one's going to walk into a party and do this. Hey, an angry guy. Maybe he'll explode. You don't do that. Wow, she looks miserable. Sit with us. Ruin our night. You don't do that at a party. No, that would be ridiculous. No, you're going to go in and look for people who are fun, energetic, enthusiastic. Right? Enthusiasm is another one of those words that I like. Guess what? You're not always going to feel like being enthusiastic. But guess what? Enthusiasm is not a feeling. It's a Greek word. It comes from the word entheos. It's the same word we get theology. Enthusiasm is not a feeling. It's a belief. Do you believe in what you're doing so much that when you enter a room, everybody else can feel it? That's in, that's in theos right there. I don't always feel like getting up here. I did today, but I don't always. It doesn't matter how I feel. I believe in what I'm talking about so much, I hope you can feel it. All right, and that's the spirit behind it. I'm notorious for giving all my energy to you guys and leaving nothing in the tank for when I get home. And I bet you there's some other people in here in the room that are just like it. I try to Superman everything. I think I can handle it all. And then I get home and I have nothing in the tank. Guess what? I got a 17-year-old and a 13-year-old. They deserve to see an enthusiastic dad walk through the door. And I have to spend one minute in the car and realize it's not a feeling, it's a belief. And I've got to get myself ready to walk in the door. Just spend a little energy just thinking through, how am I walking in the door? Am I showing that enthusiasm? Because if you just work on it a little bit every day, it's going to grow. And people will start to notice. They will notice. All right. Well, to the point and where I spend a lot of my time is idea of culture. If we create this environment, we begin to spend energy around this, culture begins to shift. It begins to form. As we unite, 
as this collective body unites in this operational excellence that you do, culture forms, and culture's tricky. I like to think of culture like this. Let me ask all of you, why did you start doing this in the first place? Every now and then I'm getting on an airplane or I'm missing another volleyball tournament or I'm missing another baseball game and I have to go back to this image and say, why did I start doing this in the first place? You know why? Because there's purpose in it. Everybody in this room, there's purpose in what you do. There's meaning in it. I mean, I'm talking deep meaning in what you do. It doesn't matter what position you hold. Everybody's valuable. Everybody's important. And so if we go back to that seedling, how do I create this environment around this seedling so it thrives? And you might want to look at yourself that way. You might want to look at a student that way. You might want to look at your department that way. How do we create an environment in our department so it thrives? Now, the reality is it goes in cycles, and this is a real simple way of looking at it. There's a risk-taking cycle, this startup mode, and that's kind of the seedling, this idea that, and so if you get a new position, or maybe you get a, maybe there's changes in, in, in different levels, but those changes, it's that, that place, that startup culture. But the reality of this district, Dallas ISD, man, you've been growing for some time. You've been building, recruiting, and managing. This is awesome, right? what you guys have established. And maybe even hitting the maturity phase. There's heated competition where we got new products, new strategies. What are we gonna do next? How do we keep enrollment up, as we just talked about? And so where I hope you are right now is this in this learning mindset. Before the school year starts, we're saying, let's don't lose our edge. How do we learn our way to the next level? So you have someone like me come out and challenge your thinking. Maybe I'm presenting ideas that you already know about. Maybe I'm just saying it in a different way, but I've just challenged you how do we learn our way to the next level? You know, Southwest Airlines is great at this. The entire American Airlines industry said, let's charge people to check their bags. What did Southwest say? Bags fly free, thank you very much. They did a national ad campaign around something they already didn't do. That is brilliant. You know why? Because there's a sense of fair play about that. Whatever you're doing right now, create a sense of fair play for your coworker. Create a sense of fair play for your student. Create a sense of fair play for your parent. They deserve it, right? You deserve it. We wanna create a sense of fair play for ourselves. But we're gonna have to start thinking in terms of making these adjustments because it is gonna require us to make changes. And I know a lot of changes happen, so we gotta hold on to what grounds us in this service culture and be willing to make adjustments. And if change is inevitable, the best thing you can do is to go with the flow. Get into the groove, don't fight it, because it's inevitable. You might as well just go with it and try to maintain enthusiasm and maintain energy through the process. This is probably a better picture of Dallas ISD. You guys have a deep-rooted culture, and maybe it's not everything you want. Maybe there's some adjustments we wanna make to that culture. Guess how those adjustments happen? There's evidence above ground in what people are doing. And if enough people start doing those things, start creating a culture of service, and I'm gonna give you some ideas in just a minute about how to do that, the, the culture begins to shift. It begins to change. And you can own it, you can be a part of it. And man, it's special when you're there. I work for Southwest Airlines and I still, still, miss them in some of the best years. I still do a lot of projects with them. I just like staying close to them because they created such a cool environment for their employees. So do you think that the top level created that for the the employees or do you think the employees created that? It's both and, but I can tell you collectively, it was the employees who came together that said, we're gonna create a fun place to work, we're gonna protect our legacy, we're not gonna talk bad about the company outside the four walls, and man, they came together to create this culture. And what that really is, is our values. Who are you? What do you say you believe? Southwest, they were very specific. Uh, I have a, I spent some time with a couple of companies I'm gonna share with you just quickly. Um, it's not related to education, although I, kind of is. First, I spent some time with Google. And if you know anything about Google, if you, haven't, if you don't know anything about them, watch the movie The Internship. It's a great example of really the culture that they have. 
But I spent time there, and they had this wonderful, attractive campus, and they, they have free food all day long. They have a free dry cleaners. Uh, they have gaming areas and pods where you can nap and all these things. And I, I, I said to them, I said, this is fantastic. You're meeting needs and employees that aren't being met anywhere else. What a great thing to do. And they said, yeah, Jason, that's true, but that's not why we do it. They said, everything we do is about connection. Our business model is to connect people to information around the world. And so internally, we're trying to connect with our employees. What would happen if we spent every day coming in just trying to build connection? What a powerful thing to do. Just build connection. And that's what they do. You see the, the cafeteria there? Their tables are really close together. And they put them close together so that when you have to sit down, you have to say, excuse me, excuse me. They call it the Google bump. They have a word for it. They want you to have to talk to people. They, if, the, if the line forms and the dry cleaners, they say, okay, it's okay. They tell the attendant, just slow it down. Let people talk. It's okay. All right? They're trying to help people build connection. Here's another group that I spent time with, Starbucks. Anybody familiar with Starbucks? Check this out. Features of Starbucks culture. Servant leadership, relationship-driven approach, collaboration, communication, openness, inclusion, diversity. Why did they shut down all their stores to do training? Because one of their employees didn't do the last value. And they said, that's unacceptable. We're going to make sure that doesn't happen again. They, why, did they, why did they spend that money? Because it's who they say they are. They had to. It's who they say they are. And so when we start thinking about who we are, how does that manifest itself in our behavior? Are we willing to step forward and say, I'm going to stand up for this because it's who I am. It's what I believe. This is my chosen career, and I'm going to make sure that I do it with all my might. They think it's a key differentiator. It's a key success factor. It differentiates themselves from other competitors. That's why they can sell us a $7 caramel macchiato or whatever it is. No wonder. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about my alma mater, Southwest. Has anybody here flown Southwest? Oh, good. Some of you? All right. Thank you. This used to be written all in one statement, but they split it up. And the first part is their vision statement, to become the world's most, um, most loved, most flown, and most profitable airline. Now, I can tell you for a fact, they are the most profitable domestically. They are the most flown domestically. That's just a fact. And I could argue, from my perspective, that they are the most loved, depending on who you like to fly. I like flying Southwest. Um, what a great statement, right? Look at number two, the purpose. There's that word again. Let's connect. Connect people to what's important in their lives through friendly, reliable, and low-cost air travel. If you've flown Southwest, you've probably seen them do some fun things. They sing their in-flight safety briefing. They just do fun things. And they're trying to connect with their audience and they're trying to lower tension because traveling is stressful, especially air travel. It's stressful these days. I fly every week and it's stressful. And so Southwest tries to lower that tension so that they can get their employees to relax. I mean, their customers to relax. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. I was flying out of San Antonio. Uh, it was a uh, five o'clock flight, full, full flight back to Dallas. I boarded late and you know, they had the open seating policy. So I'm between these two bodybuilders and man, I'm squeezed in there and I'm hot and grumpy and uh, the whole plane's hot and grumpy. And if you've ever flown Southwest and you're on one of those hot flights, it's just ugh. And the flight attendant must've realized that everybody was uncomfortable. And so she, she just did a little um, technique to try to lower everyone's tension. And here's what she did. She came out of the front galley and she had a roll of toilet paper. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen them do toilet paper races before, but they'll give each side of the aisle a roll of toilet paper and see who can get to the back the fastest, and they'll buy that side of uh, a drink. But she didn't do that. She begins to unroll the toilet paper down the aisle. Now, we're taxiing out for takeoff, and this flight attendant's unrolling this toilet paper. I'm thinking, what is she doing? I'm telling these guys next to me, in 30 years of flying, I've never seen this. She gets to the back galley, and she makes an announcement. She said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to demonstrate how strong the flush is on our toilets. And I'm thinking, no way, that's not gonna work. She said, one, two, 
three, push, and that thing went right down the aisle. And everybody starts to laugh. Nobody complained about that flight because she did something creative. Why not? We spend half our awake life at work, right? It ought to be a place we enjoy going. Life's too short to live in a bad mood. You know what I found out? Life's also too long to live in a bad mood. It's not worth it. I was flying out of Orange County. If you've ever flown out of Orange County, they have a noise abatement law. So when you take off, you have to blast off. And uh, you can't fly in too early, you'll wake everybody up. You can't fly out too late, you'll keep everybody up. And when you, fl- when you take off, you've got to go to 3,000 feet, you level off, you quiet those engines down, you cruise out of town, and then you can fly out. It's the noise abatement law. Well, the last time I flew on it, it's a stressful climb out. The pilot actually gives you a warning before she, he, uh, he or she takes off. And uh, the last time I flew on it, the flight attendant takes the basket, puts all the snacks in the basket, and puts it in the aisle. That plane starts to rotate, that basket started sliding down the aisle. Flight attendant comes on and makes an announcement. She said, ladies and gentlemen, please grab your snacks as they go by. (laughs) I thought that was pretty funny. I'll take that one, I'll take that one. I think we have some room to lighten it up. Let's have a little more fun. Uh, When I left Los Angeles, I joined the University for People, which is our, uh, it was our learning center for all of our leadership development, all of our customer service initiatives. And they put me on a team of four people and our job was to research, design, and deliver a system-wide customer service program. Uh, they called us the J team because all our names started with J. Julie, Janine, Joey, and Jason. And uh, probably some of the best work I think I've ever done. I, I enjoyed that so much. And what I would do is I would find the customer service people who had the best service record. You know, the best uniform standards, the fewest cash errors uh, at your position on time. There, there's, there are certain behaviors that predict success in any job. If I were to come in and and go into any department and look at any position, I could determine what are the behaviors that predict success in this job. And then I could put training around that and I could manage to that and I guarantee you we would start to see a trend of better performance because we're measuring the things that matter, right? There's certain behaviors that predict success in anything, any job. And so um, I found one lady at Southwest, she had more customer compliment letters than anybody in the system. Just like in this room, if I wanted to know who's a customer service rock star, I'd say, who gets the most compliments? Who do the people want to be around? Who who do people gravitate to? Who do employees gravitate to? And I would go find that person. I would say, what do you do that makes you so special? And I could document that. And so I found one person. She works in Houston Hobby Airport, and she has more customer compliment letters than anybody in the system. Her name's Carol. And so I went to work with Carol for a day, and I was just documenting what are some of the things that she's doing that makes her so special. And Carol's a tall lady. She's kind of funny. She has different name tags because people call you different things at the airport. They'll say, hey, you. So she has a name tag that says, hey, you. I think that's funny. And we're working the gate podium, and and we look up, and we see a guy my size, if not bigger, and he's in a dead sprint, man. He thinks he's late for his flight. He comes up to Carol, and he says, hey, lady, do I have time to go to the bathroom? She said, I don't know. I've never timed you. (laughs) I think that's funny. And this guy gets this grin on his face. And his day changed right there. I mean, he went from stressed to blessed right there. Why not? Why not make someone's day? They're already stressed out enough. Why don't we come alongside and say, hey, man, let's lighten this thing up a little bit. He goes to the bathroom. He comes out. She says, sir, by the way, if you ever need to know, you're a three-minute bathroom guy. I think that's funny, right? He'll never forget her. He'll never forget Carol. I won't either. It was a great exchange. Just let's go back and be that person. Let's lighten up someone's day. Let's make their day. I mean, even when things are bad, you can use humor. We had a pilot who landed really hard. You ever been on a hard landing? I fly a bunch. I've been on several. And man, the pilot rocks it down on the tarmac, and there's a white knuckle moment, and usually there's some screams. And then there's this eerie silence that always happens as the plane taxis in. And everyone's looking around going, God, what just happened? And right in the middle of the silence, the captain came on, and he said this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that wasn't your fault and that wasn't my fault. That was the ass fault. I thought that was a pretty good way to handle it. All right, they went from mad to glad just like that. I think we have some room to lighten it up. I really do. And of course, their mission is dedication, the highest quality of customer service. What kind of customer service? The highest quality. How are we going to deliver that with a sense of warmth, friendliness, individual pride, and company spirit? And this is something we can hire to, we can manage to, um, we can build training around all of those things because every one of those words matter. And so 
let's go back and look. Right? A couple of quotes that I like from Southwest. They're a transportation company. This happened to be in the, I mean, they're a customer service company. This happened to be in the transportation business. And the level of service we give externally is only going to be as good as the level we give internally. So let's start taking care of each other. All right, I'm going to quickly run through yours. I just went online and snagged these, but what do you believe? And I want you to just do your own inventory right now. Are you doing these things? Are you focused on student achievement? Our priority in, in motivation is always student achievement. Is that our goal? Is that something I think about when I walk in the building? If not, let's start focusing on it because it's who you say you are. There ought to be evidence in our behavior. Are we fast in the delivery of products and services? Use your time efficiently to meet goals, right? And deliver service. Guys, I, I know that you guys do the best you can and that sometimes you're not fully appreciated because that's the nature of the work. But let's show that appreciation to each other. Let's celebrate together and say, hey, great job, even if nobody else is. All right, I'll take a clap on that. Thank you very much. All right, why not? Because sometimes it's a thankless job. It is. All right. They don't know your name until the AC goes out. <laughs> all of a sudden, everybody gets fired up, right? We got a problem on campus. All of a sudden, security is real important. Yeah. They're, they're not even thinking about how, you know, how important that ride is in the morning until <laughs> the bus doesn't show, right? And I could go on and on. Believe me, I know. You know, our ramp agents at Southwest, thankless job. No one's writing them letters, thanks for putting my bags on, thanks for, you know, throwing them on board or placing them gently on board. I mean, no one's, you know, even our, even our captains and our flight attendants, I mean, they get a little more recognition than most, but sometimes zero. But guess what? They appreciate each other, and they know at the end of the day that they did the right thing. So let's, let's be encouraged. Let's encourage each other, right? That word encourage, core, right? that, that means heart. Let's, let's appeal to each other's heart. All right. So let's be fast. Let's be flexible, right? Let's be open to other ideas. Believe me, what got you here is probably not going to get you to the next place. We all have patterns of thinking and behaving, and some of them go way back. All right? I got patterns of thinking and behaving in my head, and they go back to my dad. He's been dead 37 years. And they still come out in the way I parent, the way I do relationships, the way I do finance, the way I do a lot of things. And guess what? They don't work. My dad was military. In our house, we didn't say what, yeah, huh, or why. You just said, yes, sir. And he didn't have to call you twice. And uh, man, it, I have a tendency, I have a 13 year old, and he's a little boy trapped in a big body. And I'm telling you what, he'll throw these fits and man, I just snap into that old thinking and it doesn't work. I have to be flexible, I have to look at new approaches. Um, you know, it's embarrassing when you're in the mall and your son throws a fit and everyone's like, control your 12 year old. I was like, he's only six, you know, he's just, He's just this little boy in a big body. But we all have to make adjustments. We can't keep doing the same thing this year, thinking it's gonna you know, get the same result we did 10 years ago. It's just not gonna work. We're gonna have to make adjustments, have to be flexible, listen to new ideas. And then let's be friendly. A positive culture starts with you. It's a choice we make every day. And I know that circumstances aren't always good. Right? We all go through rough patches and we all have issues but let's try to come together. And when we're here and when we're together, let's be an encouragement. Let's be friendly. Let's try to use our enthusiasm and inspiration every day. I love the core four. I think it's great. So I would encourage you guys, go back, revisit it, and know it and try to live it every day. Well, that brings us to the moment of truth. And I'm gonna start sliding us into the, the home base here. I sense just, for the most part, I've had great engagement. Thank you guys, I haven't seen one long blink yet. Thank you very much for showing up. Thank you for your level of engagement, I appreciate it. Thank you, yeah, you guys have been fantastic. And here's what I sense about this, no, here's what I know about you. I know at the core of who you are, you guys value this stuff. You would not do what you do if you didn't value it. 
And I know you do, because I know you're not just coming here trading hours for dollars. There's purpose behind what you do. There's meaning behind what you do. And believe me, there's more people than you know that appreciate it. I wish they would verbalize it more, but they appreciate it. So at the core of who we are, we value this. And there's probably some pretty good intentions. Even after this conference, you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna go back and man, I'm gonna, I'm really gonna do a great job this year. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come in with enthusiasm every day. There's some great intentions. But if I come to visit you, the only thing I'm gonna be able to see is what you actually do. So my perception outside looking in is based on what I see you do. So you could tell me you value this, but if I don't see evidence, do you really value it? I'll give you an example. I value health and fitness. I do. I intend to work out, right? Now, unless the people who know and love me see me doing the work, they're gonna say, you don't value health and fitness because you don't do anything. Now, I'm gonna confess, I've been to a lot of conferences and I've been to a lot of buffets and, and I've kind of let it creep up on me. I mean, there's about 50 pounds of me that my wife's not legally married to. I mean, it's just, my brothers and I invented a new style of clothing called turtleneck jeans. They just roll right over. Anyway, so I got my physical and the doctor got my attention. He said, you have high blood everything. <laughs> I was like, uh-oh. And I didn't know they could do this, but he gave me a prescription for an elliptical machine. He said, you got to get moving, big boy. And I've been on this thing, and I've dropped 26, man, and my cholesterol's down, my blood pressure's down, my blood sugar's down, and I'm on this thing, and I'm, right? Guess what? Now there's evidence. And the people who know me say, yeah, Dad, he, he values it because he's doing the work. i got to keep going. i got a long way to go. But it's, you know, it's progress. It's not perfection, right? we got to keep making progress. we got to keep moving. We gotta, let's not hesitate. Let's go back and take action. Everybody here has the ability to take the next step. So go back and let's encourage each other and let's take those steps. Now, this is tough when you say it's about customer service. If it's just about me and doing the work, I can do that. But when I say I value somebody else, uh-oh, I have to give up my point of view and I have to understand their viewing point and meet them there. That's hard. I like personal stories because I can remember. I think they make good uh, translation. I value my wife. I've already talked about her. I do. Uh, I have to do things to show care and concern for her, correct? Correct. From whose perspective? All the ladies. Hers. <laughs> right. You're exactly right. I've got to give up my point of view, understand her viewing point. I've got to do things that are valuable to her. I am not that smart. I'm just not. So I ask her. I said, do me a favor. Make me a list of five things, if I do them on a regular basis, would be a sign of care and concern. She didn't even blink. And she makes this list, and there you go, big boy. You know, I'm looking at, and I'm looking at this going, how can that be a sign of care and concern? I'm hoping for cowboy season tickets. Now, that would be good family time, don't you think? Or a boat. Let's get out on the lake together. You know what number one on her list is? Back rubs and foot massages. I said, that's two. She said, nope, that's one. She says it's the same category. I don't understand that. Now, what's the last thing? I'm on my feet all day. I talk all day. What's the last thing I feel like doing when I get home? Rubbing feet. I don't want to do that. I'm like that Darius Rucker song. All I want you to leave me is alone, <laughs> right? But guess what? I'm gone a lot. And so when I'm home, she wants physical presence and she wants conversation. Guess what? Those are the best conversations we have. It's kind of like working out. In my current state, I rarely feel like working out ahead of time. I have never once regretted it after the fact. Isn't that amazing? Some of you have some stuff you've got to go do right now that you don't want to do. I promise you, you will not regret it after the fact. Act on it. Don't hesitate. Go back. Clear the air. Let's lower the tension. Let's change the conversation so that we can work better together. Guess what? When you're talking about customer service, it's coming at you from all sides. So we're going to have to be flexible and friendly and fast and focused. All right. Because behavior is so critical to this and because people are watching you, I'm going to give you two pieces of research. You've probably already seen these, but I'm just going to give it to you quickly. 
Here's what people notice when they see you on campus, when you enter a room, here's what they notice about you. Appearance, facial expression, eye contact, body movement, personal space, touch. We've got to wake this up. We think we're giving great service, but all they see is a mean person or they see an angry person because of our body language, because of our appearance, because of our eye contact. Let's wake this tool up. Now be careful with touch. You guys know that. Be careful with touch. I mean, even at Southwest Airlines, everybody hugs there. They hug so much that the HR department made them put a hug policy in the employee manual. The policy was this. You can hug, but don't linger. <laughs> That's a good policy. Keep you out of HR. Next one, sending and receiving emotional signals. I know you've seen this one, Albert Moravian. Over half of the emotional signal you send every day has to do with your gestures. It's how people see you. Let's wake it up. Let's go back and be more deliberate about how we're coming across. Let me do an experiment with you, show you how powerful gestures are. Um, just everybody go with me on this, okay? I know that there's, uh, we're, we're, we're almost done. Everybody make a circle like this. Just, just do it with me and put it way up in the air. Everybody, got it, almost everybody over here. Now I want everybody to move it down and put it right on your chin. On your chin. <laughs> on your chin. <laughs> I bet you I had about 80% of you right here. See, it didn't matter what I said. What I said was chin, but I put my, and I had, I had about 80% of you right here. I did a, I was asked to do a speech in London and uh, they said, we want you to do a 45 minute talk on basic communication skills. I said, you realize I live in Dallas, Texas. I said, we don't care. We want you to come to London and do this. So I flew over there. There's 4,000 people in this audience. I said, I want you to put it right down on your chin. I bet you I had 99% of them right here. I said, on your chin, they all did this. <laughs> it's not your chin, dude. Let's wake it up. You have a, there's so much power in who you are and how you carry yourself. Don't underestimate the impact you have. Just, just, just your presence. It's powerful. It doesn't matter what you do. Stand tall, you know, be confident, and realize the power that you have in, in just your gestures. All right, well, let's, let's get into some best practices and then I'm gonna wind us up. When you leave here, embrace the defined goals, right, and expectations. Don't fight against them, just embrace them. The core four, embrace it. Get the tools and training to ensure success. If you feel like you're not equipped, then there's tons of resources. You don't even have to get them from here. You can go online and find tons of resources. Make sure you're using your talents and strengths. I'm gonna land on this just for a second. Don Clifton wrote a book called Soar With Your Strengths and he did an experiment. He took some people that could read 90 words a minute, some people who read 300 words a minute, gave them all a six week speed reading course. At the end of six weeks, which group do you think had the highest gain? Of course, the 90 are gonna grow the most because they had the furthest to go. But guess what, it's not their strength. They don't enjoy reading, they don't read for entertainment. They focused on their weakness and they went to 130 words a minute. They went from being slow to still slow compared to people who love to read. Now the other group, the 300, they love to read. They cannot not read. They can read a whole book in a weekend for entertainment, a thick one with no pictures. They can visualize the character. They can follow the plot. They focused on their strength and look what happened. They went to 1,500 words a minute, All right? They grew exponentially when they focused on their strength. Here's what a lot of us do. Some of us, we leave our strength, we go into something that's frustrating, and we think it's all because of those. That's what happened when I went to Los Angeles. I'm not an airport manager, I'm a people developer. And I went out there all for money. And I got there and I was like, what have I done to myself? Because I was not fulfilled. And I, I stayed one year, because that's how long they made me stay. And I kind of got sideways with my manager. I actually called my old boss and said, I want to come back to training. She said, you got to stay a year, that, you made a year commitment. And I'm telling you, it was tough. But you know, I had a conversation with him. I said, I wanna be able to do my best work for you. I need you to do some things for me. And man, he, he listened. And uh, you know, things got a lot better. So let, let's be willing to go back and, and have those conversations and make sure that we're getting ourselves using our strengths. All right, I'll round it out and then I'm done. Give frequent recognition and praise. Every day, just spend part of your day finding people doing things right. And it doesn't have to be, it could be anybody. It could be your coworker, it could be a student, it could be 
anybody. Just find people doing things right. Let's create a culture of appreciation. Let's create a culture of gratitude because gratitude will have a big impact on attitude. And then seek continuous learning and development. And lastly, let's listen more than we talk. That's my favorite because I talk a lot. And you know what's really neat? If you play around with those letters, if you take the word listen and you play around with the letters, it turns into silent. Wow. I'm going to wrap us up there. I, th I think it's uh, time for me to wrap. Let me leave you with one last story. Um, the first client that I worked with when I left Southwest Airlines was Hawaiian Airlines. And just through a series of events, I got connected with them. And over a period of about four years, I did several projects there. And I've become very close, uh, and I have some very dear friends there. Every time I go to Hawaii, they greet me in a special way. What do they say? Aloha. That's exactly right. But they don't just say aloha. If you're close with somebody, they will kiss cheeks and they give gifts. And it's a tradition that goes back to ancient Hawaii. And I asked a friend of mine there, her name's Kina Sai. She's an expert in the Hawaiian language. I said, Kina, what is the deal with aloha? It's such a beautiful greeting. She said, well, the ancient islanders, the Tahitian, the Tongan, the Samoan, and the Hawaiians, when they would row up on friendly visits, they would extend arms, palms up. And it was a friendly gesture that says, look, I'm unarmed. I come in peace. And these warriors would grab arms and they would say, alo. A-L-O in Hawaiian, it means front or face or presence. And they would pull each other face to face and they would share, ha. And ha is exactly what it sounds like. It's a breath. They believed if you shared breath, you shared spirit. It literally means I welcome you with my spirit. The word ha, va'i, Y-W-I in Hawaii, means water. Ha, same root word. Ha, wa'i, a place in the water that renews your spirit. A place in the water that brings life. If you guys do nothing else leaving here today, just go out and share some ha. And this is no accident, laughter is ha, ha. Now I made that up, but I think it fits, man. I think we need to laugh more. We need to bless each other more. You guys have been a joy to talk to, and with that, I wish you all a very fond aloha. God bless everybody. Thank you very much.